So our third and final panel of the day um, will be moderated by uh, Lowell Solomon. Um, Lowell, Lowell is Vice President of Community Health at Kaiser Permanente. And we'll have a double dose of Lowell because he will both moderate and serve as a speaker today. Thank you, Jillian. I'll uh, just give you a dose and a half uh, in the interest of time. Um, and thank you for staying to the bitter end. Um, I think what we want to do is get into um, the, the ground level and talk about the conditions under which state and local collaboration between health and education uh, can, uh, can really work. And I suspect, um, given the conversation over the course of the day, we're going to be uh, hearkening back to a lot of themes that were, were, were raised. Um, so what I want to do uh, to set us up um, is uh, give you a little bit of a flavor for what my organization is doing um, in the um, eight states and the District of Columbia where we operate, working with uh, uh, school partners on the ground, um, and in so doing, give you a little bit of flavor of how we come to that work and, and, and what we're up to. Um, and then I want to share some observations to set um, Terry and Kent up uh, with what some of the conditions are that, uh, that make for fruitful collaboration. Um, and in the process, I'm going to um, try to provoke us a little bit and suggest that this notion of um, thinking about how we collaborate on common goals might not be the right way to think about it. Really, we might want to think about in the uh, spirit of coincident benefits and win-wins and all that that we've talked about, going back to the health and all policies workshop uh, that, that uh, you all had uh, last fall. Um, that we really need to think about uh, convergent strategies against divergent goals. Um, and let's not confuse ourselves with the, 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 uh, that, uh, that we're all working uh, towards the same goals, because I don't think that's what we're about here. Um, uh, so, and after that, we're going to have uh, Kent and Terry uh, do their presentations. I think we're going to take a break at that point, and then we're going to come back and have conversation. So, uh, with that as for matter, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor um, for who Kaiser Permanente um, is, um, uh, just to root you in our, in our work and, and uh, in particular in our work uh, on schools. And as many of you might know, um, Kaiser Permanente is uh, the country's largest nonprofit private uh, healthcare organization. We're both a deliverer of care and a health plan. Um, I think we represent what Peter Orzog was describing as that big blob that a lot of people are trying to skate to, uh, of a place that has all the right economic incentives to invest in prevention, even though we have hospitals and doctors. Um, so we have all the right economic incentives. Um, and uh, we've got 30-some-odd uh, hospitals, uh, 15,000 doctors, uh, 180,000 employees. Um, so we've got quite an infrastructure that we're, 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 we're managing, but perhaps most importantly, we've got um, a mission. And Debbie and I were talking uh, uh, in, the, in the hall with, uh, with a couple of you about um, how important that is and what that really means. And sometimes a mission is just a mission, uh, but for a lot of organizations, particularly nonprofit organizations, particularly organizations that are rooted in community, it really makes a difference. And this is our mission. Uh, to improve the, uh, to uh, provide high quality affordable care uh, and to improve the health of the members in the communities that we serve. And that really drives a lot of our work. Importantly for this conversation though, we also have a very long uh, history in early childhood education and in schools. Um, and the first picture that you see here uh, is a um, early childhood center that uh, Henry J. Kaiser set up in the Kaiser shipyards uh, that existed during World War II up and down the west coast of the United States at the uh, personal request of Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who said that Rosie the Riveter and all the women that were entering the, the war effort really needed a place to bring their kids to so they could be good, productive uh, workers uh, and not be concerned about where their kids were when they were showing up at work. Um, and as part of those childcare centers, um, we had um, a, a pretty strong medical uh, presence there. So we did well child care, immunizations, we had an infirmary, um, and that really rooted us in uh, uh, taking our care delivery uh, setting and, and, and moving it into schools. And over the last uh, 40 years, we've done lots of other things. For 25 years, we've had an educational theater program where we have trained actor uh, educators doing school performances, doing workshops. Um, we've seen a 10, we've done, uh, done educational theater performances now for 10 million 
uh, kids uh, over uh, the last 25 years. We work uh, very strongly uh, in school-based health centers, um, uh, leveraging our own uh, expertise, uh, funding federally qualified health centers, and then in many cases, having our own physicians that uh, volunteer or do community service in those school-based cent health centers. Um, and finally, over the last 10 years, uh, we've done uh, these community health initiatives um, where we have uh, put together these multi-sector collaboratives uh, and uh, schools feature in almost every single one of those, um, working on policy systems and environmental change, uh, school uh, lunch programs, physical activity, um, uh, the whole gamut that we've talked about over the course of the day. And we've driven really incredible outcomes and seen really uh, impressive changes in uh, food and physical activity behaviors and, uh, uh, and, uh, and some of the health outcomes that are attendant there too. Um, so um, over the last uh, couple years, um, we've thought about all of the ways in which we're touching schools, including these and other programs, um, and really taken stock and tried to answer the question of what we could do if we really brought all these assets together and had a more intentional program focused on schools. Um, and um, we're, we're motivated by our success and all the, the, the touch points that we already have, but also some, uh, a really important case for, for engaging in schools. And, and this slide describes uh, the, 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 the case that presents it itself to us. 20% um, of Kaiser Permanente members spend most of their day in schools, either as teachers or school-age kids. One in five Kaiser Permanente members spend most of their days in schools. The obvious implication for us as an integrated delivery system that really cares about and has an economic motivation prevention is to extend our uh, thinking about the network and the, the, care, the care delivery system that we are into the schools and really uh, uh, address the levers of health that, that, that exist in schools. Related to that is the growing evidence base, much of it uh, summarized by the Institute of Medicine, including the APOP report that identifies schools as the hub of health. Um, and uh, increasing knowledge um, about what to do and the realization from that evidence base that schools um, are so critical in shaping behaviors. They've got a captive audience of kids that live and eat and uh, you know, uh, uh, get physical activity within the confines of that school. Um, and the fact that schools as the heart of health idea represents are um, such an important civic anchor. So it can generate health, not just for the school, but the entire community through joint use and things like that. So there's a growing evidence base that that works. Um, and then finally, um, we're driven to this work uh, by, um, uh, by a, a way of thinking about our uh, enterprise-wide approach to health um, and a total health perspective that um, Ray Baxter, who uh, is a member of this panel, has presented uh, before. Um, but uh, to kind of give you just a little bit of a flavor for that, the idea is in a population health kind of way, asking ourselves what we can do to seize on the levers of health that we know exist, not just in our medical office buildings and our hospitals, but in all these other settings that people uh, live and work and play in. Um, and uh, schools are such a vital place uh, uh, for, for, for that activity. We already have a lot of assets there. Um, and so our, um, as we think about it, um, it really made sense to us that, uh, and to our board and our uh, senior leadership up and down the organization that, um, that school health uh, could be a beachhead for us and early demonstration of this, this total health concept. Um, so all that to say that we came upon this, uh, this, this uh, uh, idea of thriving schools through our history, through our organizational strategy, through uh, some fairly deep understanding about what drives population health. And I wanted to give you a flavor um, for what um, our, 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 our thriving school strategy is. Um, firstly, um, we're focusing on health goals primarily, um, but we are also understanding that um, those aren't the goals that are uh, the most important to the educational partners that uh, we're, we're trying to work with. So we're very interested in um, academic uh, performance, um, school achievement, um, and uh, productivity of uh, of, of the workforce and their, and their experience, um, and really uh, to the idea of coincident benefits. Not getting confused that schools are focused on health goals, they're focused on implementing the common core, uh, having good uh, API scores, et, et, et cetera, but knowing that there's some, 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 some nexus opportunities there. With respect to the focus areas, um, we had a really interesting conversation, I think, in the last panel and over the course of the day about where the big opportunities are in the nexus between health and education. And I think that's a really interesting conversation we need to have uh, more about. 
Um, we focused on healthy eating and active living because those are areas of competence for us as an organization and, and our core partners. And we find a lot of resonance with the schools that we're working in. Um, but we also know that we got to meet schools where they are. Um, and, um, and school climate and behavior issues and social emotional health of, of kids is, is a huge, um, huge issue. And we've talked about that a little bit over the course of the day. And when Jim Bender talked about the uh, stress on, on teachers uh, that results from the uh, challenges there, um, that's very much a, a part of it. And I'll just give you a bit, little bit of a flavor. We have, um, uh, we're, we're doing some work around trauma-informed care. Uh, with uh, school-based health centers and school partners. Um, and uh, we just did a training a couple weeks ago in, in, in Oakland. Um, and there was a, a principal from uh, a, a school in Richmond who had come to that training um, the day after some kids had been shot in front of her school. And she described how challenging it is, what a toll it takes on the staff when you're dealing with that kind of, uh, kind of, kind of situation. Um, so we need to think about trauma-informed care, not just for the kids, but also for the secondary uh, 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 effects of, of trauma for the, for the, for the staff. Um, so we're really trying to figure out kind of what, what, what to do there that would be, uh, be significant. Uh, finally, with respect to um, the targets of our, 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 uh, our, our work, I think this is what distinguishes our work from um, a lot of other similar efforts. Clearly, we're focused on, um, on, on students, but we're also really uh, trying to lift up and focus in equal measure on the classified staff and the classroom teachers and the administrators that are on campus so we can create uh, really a, a culture of health with reinforcing uh, interventions um, that engage all of the people that are on campus every day. Um, and I think the work that, um, that Jim described, the school wellness um, survey um, that, that we worked on with uh, NEA, um, is uh, kind of shows uh, how significant and, and, and powerful and how interested teachers are in being uh, a, a solution here. And we know what happens when you don't include the teachers uh, in the work. You know that, um, that th those efforts are, are not very successful um, and can be uh, quite challenged. Um, so um, we're really trying to focus on, on, on teachers and staff as well as uh, students. We're trying to engage, and I think this is an important implication as we think about engaging uh, hospitals and the health sector as partners to education, we're trying to engage the key assets of our organization. So we're um, engaging um, the unit in Kaiser Permanente that does uh, wellness work with our customers and tailoring those uh, workforce wellness uh, uh, assets for the schools and delivering, delivering those. We're trying to engage our entire workforce in a fairly intentional way uh, to bring volunteers and um, people with varied expertises to the schools to be good partners there. Uh, and in some cases, like in Oakland Unified School District, which is uh, uh, where our hometown is, um, we've got our very senior leaders in Kaiser Permanente working with the school district on strategic planning and uh, kind of capital, uh, capital projects and project management and kind of some other assets you wouldn't necessarily uh, kind of think, think are uh, the, the obvious ones, but are really important for that, that school district. Um, finally, um, uh, another feature of the, 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 the work here is that we know we can't do it alone. We're a pretty large organization. We're, um, we think we're, we're fairly sophisticated, um, and, uh, and there's a lot of really critical partners that we need to work with. So we're working with uh, the organizations that are identified here um, to uh, put, the, put, put the work together and um, kind of build on their expertise and, and really um, uh, uh, kind of leverage what our kind of unique competencies are. So we're working with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation uh, and their program managers um, to uh, deliver uh, very intense interventions in, in, uh, across the, the, the schools that we're in. Um, we're working with the Safe Routes to School National Partnership around some physical activity work and the School Based Health Center, uh, National Assembly on School Based Health. Uh, or the National Alliance for School-Based Health Centers as they've been renamed, uh, to really take uh, the school-based health centers and figure out how they could be a driver of school wellness in a big way. Um, and so far, out of the 14,000 schools that are in our footprint, um, we've been able to uh, engage about uh, 1,000 schools in the physical activity work. Um, about 250 schools are now involved in this uh, thriving schools work with the Alliance for uh, a Healthier Generation, and we just brought on the LA Unified School District, the nation's second largest school district. So we're exciting about excited about things uh, happening there, um, and uh, we're just uh, putting into place our uh, evaluation. So we're getting good baseline data, so we'll be able to um, kind of tell some of those success stories and understand what works and what doesn't. Uh, m moving on. 
Um, so I wanted to, uh, 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 before I introduce the other uh, panelists, um, give you a, a, a little bit of observations about what the conditions are for cross-sector uh, collaboration that we've learned from our experience in thriving schools and all the work that preceded it. Um, and I wanted to start off with kind of a big frame, which is that um, as uh, a number of speakers have referenced before, we're in this interesting period of incredible transformation. Um, both the health system and the education system are undergoing incredible transformation. We've got um, uh, healthcare organizations that are trying to figure out new pay payment arrangements, doing all the things that Peter Orzog was, was describing. Um, we've got the educational system trying to figure out um, how to implement the common core. On one hand, uh, and address the budget issues and all those other things. So on one hand, that really drives us to sticking to our own knitting. And that is not necessarily a good culture for collaboration. On the other hand, um, and I'd like to kind of put that hand higher, um, we need each other so much more than ever. Health needs education to deliver prevention and to bend the trend in a sustainable way on healthcare cost growth. Um, education needs health to have kids that are ready to learn and all those other things. And I think that is creating some really interesting conversations. So in short, um, the conditions for success that I would uh, kind of lay out there um, for, for the rest of our conversation is that we really need to be focused on where we have convergent strategies, even though our goals might be distinct and not try to uh, enlist education in health, and health doesn't necessarily need to get enlisted in education. We've got to figure out what the work is that we could do together that, um, that, that, that uh, drives our, 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 our divergent goals. We need to really support people that are bilingual in health and education, translators, and resources, resource them and support them on the ground. Um, these local champions are so incredibly powerful. We need to nurture them. We need to provide uh, sustainable funding streams for them. Um, and uh, as we talked about today, um, that's a, a really critical piece. We really need to mind the gap between um, knowledge and practice. We have found very few people in education that don't understand the connection between health and education, but it's all a matter of making uh, the healthy choice the easy choice, so to speak, and making it easy for them to implement those practices that are evidence-based and are, are going to make a difference. Um, and finally, um, we've talked a bit about uh, measurement and accountability systems, uh, and I, I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that when, uh, as we move forward. Um, but that is really what institutionalizes the incentives. Uh, we've talked about the Colorado work, which uh, uh, is, is very exciting, um, but uh, Robert Kaplan's point about the opportunities for natural experimentation, imagine what we can do if we have educational data systems that include core health measures, uh, longitudinal, that will allow us to really kind of unpack some of these, um, uh, these relationships that right now we really uh, can't say much about because we don't have the data sets to kind of look at, at, at both those things. Um, so from a research perspective and an incentives perspective and an accountability perspective, uh, data is king and queen and court. And um, I think we're, we're, we're moving to the right place there. So, um, that's a little bit of, of, uh, of grist uh, to get us started. Um, so first, um, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to invite Kent McGuire, um, who's the president uh, and, uh, uh, and chief executive officer of the Southern Education Foundation, to come up and share his experience with a little bit of flavor uh, on, on data and indicator systems. Um, and uh, then we're going to uh, hear from Terry Wright from the American Public Health Association. <laughs> 